The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar topic today is immunotherapy and brain tumors. Thank you to today's webinar sponsor, IMVAX, for their support of this program. My name is Umbreen Mon, Program Manager here at the ABTA, and I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Peter Fetchy is a neurosurgeon scientist and serves as the director of the Center for Brain and Spine Metastases, as well as the director of the Brain Tumor Immunotherapy Program at Duke University. He offers modern surgical approaches and tailors his treatments to take into account the patient's quality of life. He has research interest in uncovering and reversing alterations to the immune systems of brain tumor patients with the goal of designing more tailored and successful personalized therapies. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fetchy. You may now begin your presentation. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, I hope, uh, hope you guys will enjoy this talk. Uh, it's a, a bit of an improvement over one we gave a couple of years ago, uh, and hopefully we'll provide a, a pretty broad overview of the types of therapies that we offer now for patients with GBM, as well as what the future holds. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll begin. <clears throat> Uh, these are the learning objectives for everybody in the audience today. We want to understand what immunotherapy is, how it can impact brain tumor treatment, uh, what advancements have been made, uh, and how they're being addressed in our ongoing research and clinical trials, as well as recognize the potential benefits and challenges of immunotherapy. Uh, and we certainly will focus on that last portion and what's being done to overcome them uh, as we proceed through the talk. So I'd like to begin these types of talks with uh, a little bit of a downer, uh, but something that I think is important to recognize. Uh, whereas these therapies have been successful in other cancers, there are currently no FDA-approved immunotherapies for GBM. Uh, and this represents a challenge to the field, uh, a gauntlet that's been thrown down, if you will, that many of us are trying to overcome. So let's begin with a little bit of a review uh, of how, in fact, the immune system might fight cancer. Uh, and I will note that I've borrowed some of these graphics from a variety of online sources. These are not mine. Uh, and in cases where it's appropriate, I've referenced the source. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, uh, the, the idea that the immune system might target cancer is one that's fairly old and dates back to the 1950s, really. Uh, and perhaps even older if we go back to the evolution of cancer immunotherapy almost to the 1890s. Uh, but it really begins uh, at the heart of everything with an antigen-presenting cell, something like a dendritic cell, uh, which is a specialized cell in the body that takes up foreign proteins and antigens, processes them, and presents them uh, in usually the lymph node or other lymphoid organs to T cells, which are kind of the effector arm of the immune response. Uh, and those T cells, once they're educated by antigen-presenting cells uh, and have been selected for their antigen specificity, can multiply and travel throughout the body looking for their target cancer cells or foreign invaders uh, to go after. And the whole idea is that cancer cells, much like foreign invaders, uh, will express proteins that are foreign to the body because they're based on mutations and therefore be recognizable as separate from self uh, and targetable by the immune system. So the goals of immunotherapy then are to treat cancer uh, like a foreign invader and to manipulate and strengthen the immune response to that foreign invader uh, and that foreign invader is recognized based on the presence of mutated, mislocated, or overexpressed proteins. T cells and or antibody recognition of these protein antigens uh, should be tumor specific or at least tumor associated, meaning there may be some shared specificity with self, but the tumors express higher levels of those targets. And we want to break down immunologic tolerance, avoid collateral autoimmunity against ourselves, uh, and institute immunologic memory, which can then reactivate. Uh, should cancer attempt to occur. <clears throat> what are the types of immunotherapy? They're the ones listed here. So passive and active are the biggest categories, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I put immune checkpoint blockade in its own category of perpetuated immunity, and then oncolytic viruses are a separate category. Uh, and we'll walk through each of these as well as some examples of, uh, of those particular types of immunity. And we'll begin with passive or transferred immunity. And this is uh, by definition, passive immunotherapy is where we actually develop the immunologic response outside the body and then transfer it back into the patients passively uh, so that that immunotherapy or immune response exists within the patient. Probably the most well-known form of that are antibody-mediated therapies, and antibodies are specialized molecules in the body that can target essentially whole proteins that are located in the humors of the body and the blood or on the surface of cells. Uh, 
And you can see that they have specialized target binding sites that will recognize whole protein, like a receptor, for instance, that is expressed on the surface of a target cell. Uh, it can also bind things that are floating around in the fluids of the body. Uh, and then there are a variety of ways that once antibodies bind those targets, they can stimulate an immune response. And we'll talk about those uh, in a specific fashion now. So one thing that antibodies can be done in the simplest form is simply block the interaction between two things. So if you imagine in this diagram here that there are receptors, let's say on the surface of a tumor cell, and those receptors may mediate the binding of ligands or molecules that once they bind the receptor, cause tumor cells to either multiply or migrate. You can imagine a scenario where you'd wanna block that signaling molecule from its receptor on a tumor cell to prevent it stimulating either multiplication or migration. And antibodies serve exactly that purpose. They can prevent ligand and receptor binding to prevent functions that tumor cells might otherwise use to replicate and or migrate throughout the body. So that's the easiest uh, and simplest version of what antibodies may do. But there are other things too. And if you think about how antibodies might bind a tumor cell specifically, you can imagine then that you can utilize those antibodies as, as a delivery system and you can attach things like a toxin, like diphtheria, for instance, or pseudomonas toxins. And those antibodies will then be injected into the body, travel to the tumor cell, bind that tumor cell, be taken up by the tumor cell and deliver that payload, which is most likely a toxin to that tumor cell, killing it. Uh, and we do have examples of these types of therapies in brain tumors. D2C7 is an immunotoxin, which is what we more broadly call these types of therapies uh, that is in clinical trials at Duke, for instance. Uh, and this is a um, this is in fact a, ter a therapy that targets both EGFR and EGFRV3 receptors on GPM uh, and delivers a toxin to those cells, killing them uh, when it's taken up by the cancers. Lastly, antibodies can be used as immune stimulators because once they actually bind to cancer cells, their kind of business end uh, or the end the other, that's not specific for a particular receptor or protein is able to attract things like complement, which is immune stimulatory, uh, or even immune cells, which can bind that common portion of antibodies. Uh, and once they actually link between antibodies uh, uh, through the antibody to the cancer cell, uh, can essentially stimulate immune activities that will kill the cancer cell. So these are the kind of various ways that antibodies can be used. Uh, but in general, this is one form of passive immunotherapy because the antibody is the immune response itself that we're delivering to people. We can also deliver T cells uh, as a means of passive transfer of, immu of uh, immune responses to patients. So how might we do that? Well, T cells exist obviously in patients already, but we can take their blood and we can isolate T cells from the blood and then multiply T cells against a specific target ex vivo, meaning outside of the body, and once we've amplified them and activated them, transfer them back into the body where they can circulate and try to find their targets, in this particular case, cancer cells, uh, in order to kill those cancer targets. So it's important to distinguish between a, different, a couple of different types of T cell therapies. There are simple adopt adoptive lymphocyte transfers, and there are things called CAR T cell therapies. So what are the differences? Well, normally, and I think this is a very important distinction to understand, T cells do not recognize whole proteins on the surface of cancer cells, like a receptor, for instance. That's not what T cell immunity is. That's sort of what antibodies do. T cells actually recognize snippets of what's happening inside of a cell. Every cell in the human body, for the most part, uh, will take everything that's going on inside of it from a protein expression perspective, chew up all those proteins that are being expressed inside at any given moment uh, and put them out like a little flag on their surface on a flagpole type molecule called MHC1. Uh, and so uh, antigen presenting cells will also present various protein, little snippets of proteins that are being expressed in the cell uh, in the context of these flagpoles, these MHC molecules to T cells, which possess a T cell receptor. And that T cell receptor is where the antigen specificity of that T cell comes from. It can only recognize small little peptides in the context of MHC molecules, i.e. it can only recognize flags on a flagpole uh, and then surveys, therefore, what types of proteins might be getting expressed within inside a cell uh, and will target and kill any cell that appears to be uh, manufacturing proteins that shouldn't be there. So the key point here is that T cells must see their targets in the context of MHC molecules or flagpoles in order for them to do their job.
Uh, however, tumor cells then are able to evade the immune system sometimes by downregulating MHC molecules on their surface, i.e. taking down their flagpoles and not showing T cells what's going on inside of them. And in that way, they become somewhat invisible to the immune system. So uh, some clever folks invented a way of making T cells no longer specific simply for the proteins that are being expressed and processed inside of a cell and then presented, but for whole proteins that are on the surface of a tumor cell, like a receptor that might be upregulated in cancer. So if we remember how antibodies work, all CAR T cells are, which stands for a chimeric antigen receptor T cell, is essentially merging the antibody specificity. So in other words, now taking specificity for whole proteins on the surface of a cancer cell, not ones that have to be presented on a flagpole, and combining that specificity with the T cell receptor machinery that T cells use to kill tumor cells or cells that have things going on inside of them that they shouldn't. And so by merging these two things, antibody type specificity with T cell receptor machinery, you now create a T cell that can recognize surface proteins on a, T on a tumor cell and kill those uh, tumor cells that are upregulating or misexpressing mutated proteins on their surface. Uh, there are a variety of generations of CAR T cells and all that really matters here is that uh, we provide different molecules inside that T cell receptor machinery uh, that provide different types of augmented function. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, the further the generation, to some degree, the better the function. So what do CAR T cell therapies look like? How do we do it? We simply take T cells out from the blood, much as we had talked about before. We create a construct, uh, essentially a gene, that encodes for that chimeric antigen receptor that we had talked about. Those T cells now will express those on their surface uh, that provide them an antibody type specificity for tumor cells. Uh, we can expand them ex vivo, infuse them into patients where they'll bind and kill cancer cells. Uh, some very prominent examples of these types of trials in patients with GBM now include this most recent paper out of the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a group up in Boston that has uh, essentially invented fairly clever CAR T cell therapies. And these are currently in clinical trial uh, and they have a nice modification that bypasses some of the problems that tumor heterogeneity can afford. Uh, so this is one to look out for, the CAR-V3 Team E T-cells. So we've talked about passive immunotherapies. Active immunotherapies uh, are a type of immunotherapy where actually we stimulate the, the individual's immune system to essentially develop and fight cancer on its own. In other words, we're not taking parts of their immune system out and putting them back in. We're simply developing inside of them the capacity to fight that cancer. And most commonly, uh, we refer to active immunotherapy as vaccines. All of you are familiar with what vaccines are in general. Cancer vaccines are simply the cancer form of those. Normally, when we think of bacteria or viruses, we think of vaccines uh, as taking essentially either a weakened or harmless version of a live pathogen. Uh, and then delivering those in conjunction with a strong immune stimulant, which we call an adjuvant, uh, in a manner that allows the immune system to recognize and better kill off these types of pathogens. However, we can swap out the word pathogen for tumor cell, uh, and in their earliest forms, cancer vaccines were simply taking irradiated tumor cells, injecting them, allowing the body to degrade those tumor cells, figure out the proteins in them, and develop a strong immune response. We don't have to deliver tumor cells. We can deliver any type of protein that might be recognizable as different about that tumor cell, or even the DNA or RNA encoding those foreign parts of tumor cells, those foreign proteins, uh, and deliver those as a vaccine in conjunction with an immune stimulant. Many of you, of course, will remember that uh, the, a lot of the COVID vaccines, for instance, were RNA vaccines. Uh, these are a very similar concept. So the elements of this, of course, are the injection. You choose your vaccine modality. The idea is that that modality is injected and eventually gets into the antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, which can either take those proteins and present them to T cells uh, themselves in the lymph node, or if it's something like an RNA or DNA, to actually take that up, translate the protein, uh, and then present that the peptide portions of that to T cells. Those T cells, once educated, uh, will go out and search for their tumor target in the periphery, uh, which will also be presenting, in theory, its targets to those T cells, and those T cells will kill the tumor cells. The ultimate goal, of course, as we talked about before, is to develop immunologic memory. Types of vaccines can really be any of those seen here. 
The most common ones are either cellular vaccines in the form of tumor cells or dendritic cells themselves. We can educate dendritic cells outside of the body and put them back in in vaccine form uh, where they will migrate to lymph nodes and stimulate T cell responses, or we can deliver the targets themselves to the body with the hope that they'll be taken up by dendritic cells, which can then go and, and educate T cells in the lymph nodes. Really, I think it's important to understand what the key goal of any vaccine modality is, which is to take any one of these different types of forms of, uh, of vaccine, uh, and we want to give it to the body and have those antigens, peptides, viruses, heat shock proteins, whatever, delivered into dendritic cells so that those dendritic cells can process uh, the relevant peptide target and present those uh, to T cells. So we are, again, trying to deliver any one of these vaccine modalities into the antigen-presenting cells of the human body so they can train a T cell response. In such a way, vaccines can be delivered through a variety of forms. So we can directly deliver, i.e. the RNA, DNA, peptide. We can coat them in things like nanoparticles uh, to allow them to be better taken up by antigen-presenting cells. We can use viruses. Uh, to deliver the genes encoding those peptides, and those viruses will be taken up by antigen-presenting cells or infect them directly. Or, as we mentioned, we can actually deliver dendritic cells themselves with the goal of educating the immune response. Uh, a good example of that latter form of vaccine, a dendritic cell vaccine, uh, is one that was recently published in Phase three trial results. Uh, it originated uh, from Linda Liao's group at UCLA. Uh, she's an outstanding neurosurgeon scientist and the chair of neurosurgery there. Uh, and this was a dendritic cell vaccine uh, that was uh, uh, loaded with all of the different peptides that your tumor cells might contain. Uh, and then those dendritic cell vaccines were delivered to patients uh, and actually had a, a reasonable response as was reported uh, a few years back. So moving through the modalities, oncolytic viruses, we'll spend a little bit less time on these, uh, but again, what is the format here? So viruses, an oncolytic virus is one that does exactly as it sounds. It's meant to essentially lyse cancer cells. So how does that work? Well, viruses oftentimes have receptors that they use to infect cells and enter cells. Uh, and so if you can have a virus that has a specificity for a receptor, let's say, that's present or upregulated on tumor cells specifically, those viruses will specifically infect, infect tumor cells, get in there, uh, replicate, and actually lyse or kill the cancer cells. Uh, and then you get an added benefit of when those tumor cells are lysed, it will dump a bunch of protein antigens specific for those cancer cells out into the body. And those, pro those antigens may be taken up by nascent antigen-presenting cells, uh, which will then further stimulate immune response by activating T cells against all those antigens that get dumped out by those dead or dying cancer cells. And so that's basically how oncolytic viruses work. I think one of the more famous versions of that in recent years has been the polio virus uh, that's been in clinical trials at Duke and in other institutions across the country. Uh, and that works off the premise that the polio virus uh, is taken up by cells via the CD155 receptor molecule, uh, which happens to be quite upregulated on GBM and other cancers. So uh, one of the more prominent forms of immunotherapy of late has been immune checkpoint blockade. These are the drugs that you often see advertised on television, things like nivolumab. Uh, uh, that's probably the classic one. Um, these are anti-PD-1 antibodies, ipilimumab, which is anti-C24, uh, pembrolizumab, you'll see all of these advertised on television. Uh, and they, these are antibodies that block the interaction between immune checkpoints, some of which you see listed here, CHLA-4 and PD-1 being the most famous. These are present on T cells. They bind various ligands on either antigen-presenting cells or tumor cells that help to down-regulate T cell responses. So really what immune checkpoint blockade is trying to do is release the brakes on the immune response so that T cells don't get turned off uh, and might be able to work better. In pictorial form, this was that diagram we showed earlier about how the immune response to cancer works. We talk about T cells being activated and then going out and recognizing and killing cancer cells. At a variety of stop, uh, step points, steps along the way, there can be checkpoints or stopping points uh, where uh, these immune checkpoints can act, turn off or downregulate T cell activity. Uh, and those stopping points can serve to limit the immune response. What we're looking here to do is to remove those checkpoints, prevent those stop signs, and keep the immune system going. Uh, so in pictorial form here, uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-C2A4 antibodies are the prime examples. 
and they can block the interaction between PD-1 or CHLA-4 on a tumor-specific T-cell with various ligands for those receptors that might help to turn off the T-cell response, and so therefore we keep that response going. So the questions are, why is there such a focus on checkpoint blockade? Why do we seem more excited by this uh, than any other particular uh, immunotherapy? And the short answer is because it's been the most successful in other cancers, even if we've not seen that type of success in GBM to date. Uh, so uh, a little bit of historical context here, uh, going back to melanoma. Melanoma is undoubtedly the cancer where immune checkpoint blockade has been by far the most successful and has been dramatically successful, more successful than any therapy to date in these cancers. Uh, you can see survival curves here. Uh, anything that's up and to the right and high over here is good. Stuff that drops down to zero here on the left is bad. And you can see that nivolumab has people that, you know, it, we don't see it drop below even 50% survival. So even many, many months out, you see 70, 80% long-term survival on uh, previously untreated melanoma as compared to chemotherapy, which you can see was not as effective historically. Uh, and this was such an incredible achievement as far as the types of responses that were seen in cancer that immune checkpoint blockade served as the nidus for the 2018 Nobel Prize in Medicine. And that was shared between Drs. Hanju and Dr. Allison uh, for uh, uh, both anti-PD-1 and anti-CHLA-4 therapies, respectively. The other thing that's been quite exciting to us in the neurosurgical and neuro-oncologic world is that there does appear to be activity in the brain. So when we combine actually those two drugs, anti-PD-1 and anti c 4 uh, as kind of a dual therapy for melanoma that's metastatic to the brain, we actually have seen dramatic responses. And a lot of times we worry that immunotherapies and other therapies will not have efficacy in the brain. That does not appear to be the case with regard to uh, checkpoint blockade, probably because it needs only to bind to T cells in the periphery, although no one's shown that specifically. But you can see in this study here, these are patients with metastatic melanoma within the brain, patients who even when I was in training, we were taught to believe might only have something like three months median survival. Now you can see that two and a half years later on these drugs, even with melanoma in the brain, there's 70 to 80% survival rates, uh, 80, actually 81.5% to be specific at a year, uh, and median survival not even reached at 30 months. Uh, in fact, so, so impressive is the response that more than one in four patients with metastatic melanoma in the brain will actually have a complete response to the combination therapy. Pretty good. So, of course, uh, it was not long before we decided to try these, these therapies in patients with GBM. Uh, that happened uh, in the years leading up to the end of that trial in 2017, which unfortunately did not reach its endpoints. That was the Checkmate 143 trial. Uh, and ultimately, we were disappointed to find uh, that we did not get the efficacy we wanted using uh, nivolumab uh, plus or minus ipilimumab in the brain. Now, that would have seemed to have been disappointing, but beginning as early or as recently as 2019, we've had some cause for optimism. Uh, this was a paper published in Nature Medicine, again, out of the UCLA group, uh, that demonstrated that changing the way in which anti-PD-1 was administered uh, to something called neoadjuvant administration appeared to maybe improve immune responses to anti-PD-1 in patients with a current glioblastoma. So what does neoadjuvant mean? It's simply a timing terminology. And I'll show you in a little bit of a diagram slide here. So the difference is the two things we wanna learn about is what does adjuvant versus neoadjuvant administration mean? So imagine we have a patient with recurrent GBM. That patient at some point is going to get surgery for their recurrent tumor, let's say. Adjuvant administration of something like pembrolizumab, which is an anti-PD-1 drug, would mean that we do a surgery. And after that surgery, we begin administering the drug. Neoadjuvant administration simply means that we begin administering the drug at a time period before the planned surgery. Uh, and there are a variety of theories as to why this may make a difference, but certainly the paper published a few years ago suggests that something as simple as timing may actually make a substantial difference. Of course, many people are interested in this, and we're beginning to study this in more detail now. But these were the results from this study, which showed that actually simply giving this drug before surgery for recurrent tumor actually significantly improved from 228 to 417 days uh, the uh, survival, the median survival probability in this patient population. So why is GBM so difficult? And why has immunotherapy perhaps not been as successful as we'd like to see to date? Uh, I think it's easiest to think about this in a few different ways. Uh, number one is tumor heterogeneity. 
So GBM is a particularly heterogeneous tumor. What do we mean by that? Well, if we find a tumor-specific target, it's a good bet that that target is only expressed by something like 20 or 30% of the cells in the tumor because there's such kind of um, variability in the, in the tumor cells themselves. And so as you can imagine, targeting only 20 to 30% of the tumor cells is not liable to have much benefit. Simply like cutting out 20 to 30% of a tumor surgically is unlikely to have much benefit. Also, we talked about the fact that the targets in tumor cells are merely mutated proteins uh, that allow tumors to be recognized as foreign. Uh, so if you don't have as many mutations in a cancer, you may not have as many targets. And unfortunately, GBM happens to have a fairly low mutational burden, which means that in general, there's a lack of targets for us to go after compared to other cancers. Likewise, with the tumor harbored within the brain, a lot of drugs don't have easy access to the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, and the immune system, uh, because of notions of quote-unquote immune privilege, which are a little bit debunked, uh, also has perhaps slightly limited access to tumors that are harbored there within. And lastly, and perhaps unbeknownst to many, GBM is really one of the most immunosuppressive cancers uh, uh, known to man, uh, uh, despite the fact that it's harbored within the brain. Uh, and so it does a lot to actually limit immune responses to it. Uh, and this is an area of focus of our research. And I'd like to highlight, I think, because this is a particularly problematic, uh, uh, a particular problem for immunotherapy, uh, some of the things that we've done to better understand immune dysfunction in GBM, as well as some of the things we've done to reverse that to make immunotherapies work better. So to be fair, we've known about this now for many years. Uh, since the 1970s, we've known that T cells are lacking in number in patients with GBM uh, and that those T cells that are left behind are somewhat uh, dysfunctional. Uh, and for many years, that was simply how we characterize things, low in number, low in function. That's really not sufficient. So we've begun to become more sophisticated in the way we characterize immune dysfunction in patients with GBM. Uh, this was a paper out of our group and Gavin Dunn, and William Curry, all of them are at MGH, uh, myself at Duke now. Uh, and this has been really uh, an area of much focus for my group, uh, where we've begun to understand immune dysfunction uh, in the context and the way immunologists and basic immunologists would characterize it. So we're gonna transition a little bit now to some of the things that we've been doing. And of course, I'll be talking about research and as such, I want to I want to qualify a few things. First off, there's going to be a lot of graphs and pictures, and the idea here isn't for you to understand necessarily what those show. Although there'll be some of you who might be interested, uh, it's really to have them as essentially pretty pictures, but to allow me to explain to you what they're trying to say. So if you focus on really uh, what the content of of what's being said is, and less on what the content of the graphs are, I think we'll get through this just fine. Um, so. Starting with T-cell dysfunction, there are a variety of ways that immunologists think about T-cell dysfunction, and perhaps not surprisingly, every one of those, which are the five listed here, uh, we can find evidence of each one of those in GBM. The one we're going to focus on today is ignorance, which is exactly as it sounds. T-cells uh, can be a little bit stupid and ignorant of the antigen targets that they have to go after, so how are we going to counteract that? So what are some examples of T-cell ignorance? What do we really mean by that? Well, one of the ways that a T-cell might remain ignorant of its target is if you trap that T-cell somewhere where it doesn't get access to its target. Uh, and so this was a paper we published a few years back. Uh, Nick chong who's pictured here, who's now a neurosurgery resident at Duke and was an MD, PhD student working in my lab for his PhD, is the first author here. And uh, what we found was that T cells, rather than going to the brain tumor where they're supposed to go, uh, in the setting of glioblastoma can become trapped in the lymphoid organs, particularly in the bone marrow, uh, where they don't have access to the tumor and can basically do no harm. Uh, so we discovered this because we recognized, as had been seen before to some extent, that patients were lymphopenic, meaning that they were missing their T cells from their blood. Uh, and in fact, about one in five, one in six, one in seven patients who presented to the emergency room with GBM actually would have T-cell counts, uh, CD4 counts below 200, which is the demarcation for progression to AIDS in HIV-infected individuals. So they were really missing their T-cells. And when we went looking throughout the body, we found that also their lymphoid organs were dramatically smaller. Uh, you can see this is actually showing the same thing in mice. These are spleens from mice uh, with brain tumors on the right, very small spleens. We found the exact same things in patients. So we also found shrunken lymphoid organ, uh, shrunken lymph nodes rather, shrunken thymus, uh, and both mice and patients have limited numbers of T cells in the blood. 
So uh, when we finally got around to checking the bone marrow, thinking that we'd see low numbers of T cells there as well, instead we found dramatically high numbers of T cells trapped in the bone marrow of both mice and patients with GBM. Interestingly, this wasn't just a phenomenon of GBM. In any tumor that we put in the brain, whether that was a glioma, EO771 is a breast cancer, B16 is a melanoma, Lewis lung cancer is a lung cancer. Anytime we put any cancer in the brains of mice, we saw exactly these same phenomena. Decreased numbers of T cells, lymphoid organ shrinkage, T cells accumulating in the bone marrow. Uh, and so that means that it's really probably not a function of GBM, but this is a mechanism that the brain harbors for keeping T cells out that the tumors are simply usurping. Uh, and we actually find that the same thing happens in just about any intracranial insult. So if we give my strokes, traumatic brain injury, we see all the same phenomena happen, albeit transiently, which again suggests that we've uncovered a mechanism of immune privilege and how the brain tries to limit inflammatory responses, limit immune access, and, T and the tumors are simply taking advantage of that. We've uncovered that the reason this happens is because in the setting of GBM and other intracranial tumors, T cells lose a receptor on their surface called S1P1, and that is a receptor that normally serves as an exit visa, allowing T cells to get out of lymphoid organs like bone marrow. And when they lose that receptor, they instead become trapped, unable to get out. So we've done some clever things like put plug in and uh, or knock in a receptor into T cells in genetically altered mice where the, that they cannot lose the S1P1 receptor from their surface. And when that happens, not much. T cells get out of bone marrow. Uh, it doesn't really produce any survival benefit because you know simply getting T cells out of bone marrow is probably not going to be enough. But if we take those mice and give them immunotherapies, now we start to see long-term survivors. And when we add things like anti-PD-1 on top of that, we really, really see that we're able to get a checkpoint blockade response in mice with GBM. What's particularly interesting about the S1P1 receptor is that's a class of receptor called the G-protein coupled receptor. Don't expect anyone to care much about that except for the fact that down the hall from me lives Bob Lefkowitz, and he won his Nobel Prize in 2012 for having discovered all of the G-protein coupled receptor class back in the 1960s. And so we have an expert down the hall who we've been able to collaborate with to try to find a drug to keep S1P1 on the surface. We've done that by targeting some of the machinery inside the cell that would normally be responsible for internalizing this receptor. Uh, and he and I are in the process now of developing, uh, we do have a, a, a very nice drug target. We just need to make it more stable in vivo. Uh, and hopefully within the next couple of years, we can beat a clinical trial with that and see some of the survival benefits that we saw in those mice. It still begs the question, though, of how do you get from um, a tumor in the brain to essentially a dramatic change in T cells throughout the body where we lose the S1P1 receptor? Uh, to investigate that, and you know, beyond the scope of this talk is kind of how we came up with this hypothesis, but to investigate that, we land on the fact that there's only a couple of ways that the brain communicates with the rest of the body, and the answer might lie within. A lot of you are familiar with the sympathetic nervous system, uh, this notion of fight or flight, the types of things that make you sweat during stress and make your pupils dilate. Uh, well, that is one of the ways that the brain communicates with the body. And we developed a theory that for some reason, processes in the brain, including any tumor we might put in the brain, may actually cause an increase in the sympathetic nervous response specifically and cause rises in things like catecholamine levels. Catecholamines are those things like adrenaline and noradrenaline, otherwise known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, and lo and bold, we, we, behold, we found that to be exactly true. So if we take GBMs, melanomas, lung cancers again, and we implant them in either the brains of mice or the flank, we see that only when they're placed within the brain do we see dramatic rises in the levels of circulating catecholamines like epinephrine or adrenaline. Uh, and that's not true when those tumors are placed in the flank. And when we go to people with GBM, we see exactly the same thing. We see dramatic rises in their catecholamine levels, and that's whether newly diagnosed or recurrent. Uh, and we found out that the receptor that's probably mediating the impact of that throughout the body is something called the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. So we started figuring out, you know, does this matter? Well, sure. If we look at patients with GBM and mice with GBM and the types of immune dysfunction that they demonstrate, we can actually recapitulate that and reproduce the exact same deficits in mice simply by putting pumps in their flank that cause catecholamines to be dumped into their circulation at high levels for a period of time. Uh, and if we give types of catecholamines or drugs that are specific for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor in particular, 
we reproduce essentially much of the immune dysfunction we see in the setting of GBM. Which then makes the question, well, then does that mean that we can reverse some of this by simply giving drugs that would block the beta-2 adrenergic receptor? And that's a class of drugs called beta blockers, some of which you've probably heard of, things like propranolol, which can be used to treat high blood pressure uh, or even intention, uh, uh, intention tremor, people who get nervous or stage fright. Propranolol is a pretty classic drug for that. Uh, and this is a cheap, easy, available drug. Uh, and we were very surprised to find that simply giving mice with brain tumors beta blockers, well, not alone, that doesn't do much alone. But if we combine beta blockers with an immunotherapy that also doesn't do much on its own, suddenly the combination produces long-term survivors in mice with GBM. Uh, and this was really a bit of a surprise. Uh, uh, because this is a very easy drug to come by. These are not tremendous responses, but given how easy those drugs are to come by, this is certainly very promising. And we're studying this a lot more as well as optimizing what types of drugs it might take to improve this. Now, the biggest thing here is that's in mice, uh, and we were able to administer those drugs prospectively in mice to make the immunotherapies work better. Uh, but we wanted to understand whether we might find any evidence, any signal that beta blockers do anything in patients with GBM. Now, these studies that I'm going to present to you are retrospective, meaning these are data looking backwards instead of forwards, and there's a lot of problems with doing that. But despite that, we would hope to find something, and lo and behold, we did. So looking in almost 9,000 patients with GBM using the SEER Medicare database, so these are patients that are universally over age 65, which is why the survival is perhaps not so great here. Looking back at those patients, we can find that in those thousands of patients, those patients who were on a beta blocker for any indication, and again, there's a lot of biases in these types of data, actually did in fact survive quite a bit longer than patients that had not been administered a beta blocker during their cancer diagnosis. Now, GBM patients don't get immunotherapy because there aren't any FDA approved, remembering all the way back to the early part of the talk, but patients with brain metastases from lung cancer and melanoma do in fact get immunotherapies. And so we can actually look in those patients to see whether or not there's a benefit of combining beta blockers with checkpoint blockade in the past, retrospectively in those populations. Uh, and what we find is yes, very much so. So uh, in fact, you can see these blue lines in both sets are the patients on the combinations and they survive much, much longer than patients on neither of the above uh, and quite a bit longer than patients who are on immunotherapy alone. 30% longer in patients with lung cancer with brain metastases, and 60% longer in patients with melanoma with brain metastases. And this is 25,000 patients with brain mets from lung cancer and about 3,000 patients uh, with brain metastases from melanoma. And again, it's those brain processes that are going to cause increases in systemic catecholamines. We do expect for a variety of reasons that are beyond the scope here for beta blockers to have impact in cancer in general. However, you see that the patients without brain metastases, extracranial metastases only, don't get quite the same benefit as those that actually have brain metastases. So this is a particularly exciting therapeutic that may work in the setting of tumors within the brain. So we're obviously very interested in this, and we need to ultimately do a prospective study giving patients uh, beta blockers with immunotherapy. Uh, but we're also very interested in understanding how do you actually get activation of the sympathetic nervous system in the setting of brain insults? And that's a collaboration that we're actively engaged with with a group out at Stanford, Michelle Mondi's group. Uh, and we're hoping to have more data on that for you soon. Uh, we think we're on the right track. So last part of this talk, and hopefully one last glimmer of extra hope as we look to understand how we might move forward with novel immunotherapeutic modalities. Uh, this is something that we published uh, in the journal Nature Cancer last year. Uh, and this is to say that uh, we have uncovered a novel means by which T cells kill cancer. And this is something that our own group and others are taking advantage of to try to build entirely novel classes of immunotherapies. This one I'll go through quite quickly so that we have plenty of time to answer questions uh, because I, I think the experiments themselves are fairly complicated but the take home messages are what are really important here. So we're gonna go back to a diagram I showed earlier in the talk. Uh, and by the way, this is the work of Emily Lerner, a very talented MD PhD student in the lab uh, who's uh, currently finishing up medical school and going into radiology. So we talked earlier about this notion that T cells historically have been thought of as cells that must see their antigen, a peptide antigen being processed and or being uh, expressed, processed and presented inside a target cell or inside an antigen presenting cell must see that antigen in the context of MHC molecules. So antigen presenting cells will process and present antigen in the context of MHC to T cells. 
uh, via the T-cell receptor. Those T-cells then uh, can only go out and search and destroy tumor cells that then present that same cognate antigen in the context of MHC molecules. That's the only way T-cells can recognize their targets and kill the cell of interest. So that has been the model for many, many, many decades. And what I'm here to tell you is that that model is not correct. Uh, so this is what a typical survival curve looks like for immunotherapies. We can create tumors. We can put tumors that have a rejection antigen in them that are homogeneously expressed. CT2 is glioma, TRIP2 is an antigen. And when we give a combination of immunotherapies, we can get a modicum of survival in mice with glioblastoma if we have a tumor that homogeneously expresses an antigen. Well, we had been interested for reasons that are beyond the scope of things. Uh, we had been interested in understanding what would happen if we knocked out MHC molecules in tumor cells. Uh, and we were studying T cell exhaustion, but a graduate student in the lab decided to figure out what happens if we knock out MHC molecules in tumor cells. In theory, immunotherapies should no longer work. And so we put these tumors that didn't have MHC molecules into the brains of mice. So whenever you see this beta 2M knockout, beta 2M is a building block of MHC molecules. If you knock it out, uh, the cells can't build MHC and therefore can't present antigen to T cells. So these tumors should have been unrecognizable to T cells because they lacked MHC on their surface and could not present the TRIP2 antigen that was being made inside the cell. Lo and behold, however, quite to our uh, excitement and shock, Immunotherapies worked just fine, if anything, quite well in mice that had tumors that could not present antigen. That makes absolutely no sense if you understand how the immune system is supposed to work based on that diagram we just showed you. And this works with any tumor. It doesn't matter if it's a glioma. We did this with melanoma. We could put it in the brain, put it in the flank, and even and no matter what tumor doesn't have MHC on their surface, immunotherapy works just fine. Uh, and it doesn't make sense. We looked at depleting all other types of immune cells that might play a role here. Eventually, we got around to getting rid of T cells. And when we got rid of T cells, the one cell in the body that should be necessary uh, uh, and shouldn't be the one mediating a response against a tumor cell that doesn't have MHC, lo and behold, this all went away. So very surprisingly, this immune response against a tumor cell that doesn't have MHC on its surface still depends on the very cell in the body that is meant to recognize its antigen in the context of MHC. However, what we did find, and I'll skip the details of this, is that it actually still matters what the T cell recognizes. And if you take away specificity, antigen specificity from the T cell, you kind of lose the response. Uh, and it turns out that uh, what you need actually is, and I'll, again, won't go through the details of this, is you need T cells to be activated in antigen-specific fashion by some type of antigen-presenting cell. And so that's where the role of antigen is here. Those T cells must be activated by an antigen-presenting cell via their T cell receptor. However, what's shocking is that once those T cells are activated in antigen-specific fashion, they can know they can now go out and kill tumors that neither express the relevant antigen of interest nor have any MHC on their surface via which they would present that antigen. So these are T cells that are specific for the OVA antigen, OT1 T cells, and we've activated them against the OVA peptide in the context of uh, macrophages presenting OVA to them. And once these OVA specific T cells are activated, they can go out and kill a glioma that neither expresses OVA nor has any MHC on its surface via which it would present the OVA antigen. Doesn't make sense in the context of what we know, but what we ultimately figured out is that the killing here takes place through a, a, an adjacent mechanism. We found that T cells in tumors that lack MHC upregulate a particular cytotoxicity molecule that they can use to kill cells called NKG2D. NKG2D is normally an NK cell activation marker, but does play a role in T cells. Uh, and when we block the interaction of NKG2D with its ligands, we get rid of this very killing mechanism that we've been talking about uh, for this latter portion of the talk. Uh, and so now T cells can no longer kill MHC deficient tumors if we block NKG2D on their surface. And NKG2D, and that's true both in mice, by the way, in vivo and in vitro, and in human cancer cells in vitro, this mechanism is in fact active in human cancer. And the reason is that tumors themselves typically upregulate NKG2D ligands, which is what the T cell NKG2D recognizes in order to kill them. So the question is, is there enough of these ligands on tumor cells to allow that killing? There sure is. Uh, 
They're actually quite ubiquitously expressed on tumors. And not only that, but even in human tumors, uh, and when tumors lack MHC on their surface, even naturally via mutation, those tumors that lack MHC have even higher levels of these ligands, making them particularly susceptible to this killing mechanism. Uh, and uh, what's very interesting is that we can actually take mouse NKG2D ligands, plug them into human cancer cells that don't have MHC on their surface, and just doing that will allow those human cancer cells to be killed by mouse T cells. So a very powerful killing mechanism, very interesting mechanism. Uh, and so as a result of this, we've begun to invent a variety of technologies that can be used uh, and therapeutics that can be used to target this NKG2D ligand, NKG2D axis, uh, because this is really an entirely new immunotherapeutic approach uh, that, we can avail of our, that we can avail of in order to start to target cancers. And GBM, as you saw in that slide, expresses high levels of these ligands, making it something that would be you know, one of the most ubiquitous targets that we can find on these cells. And as such, one of the therapies that we've begun to develop is something that we call the Care Bear Project, uh, uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells engineered with bispecific engagers without antigen requirements. Care Bear Project's a lot easier to say, of course, uh, and this is an area of active investigation for us. We've had a lot of success getting this working so far, both in vitro and in mice with GBM, and we're very excited to hopefully bring this out uh, we've uh, patented this and are spinning off a company soon, and hopefully this will be uh, into people in the next couple of years. So hopefully we provided you a very nice overview of the various types of immunotherapies, uh, some of the challenges facing immunotherapies, uh, some examples of some of these immunotherapies out there for GBM right now, as well as what a lot of us are doing on the more basic science side to begin to counteract some of those challenges that we discussed, uh, and maybe some hope for the future with some of the therapeutics uh, and potential mechanisms of avoiding this immunosuppressive mechanisms of GBM uh, that we can avail ourselves of in the coming years. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank uh, all of you for listening and for your attention. I'll thank those members of my lab and our collaborators that are responsible for the work that you saw, as well as a lot of the funding mechanisms that have helped to fund that work. Uh, and uh, with that, happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fetchy. Just as a reminder to our attendees, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please type and submit it using the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen, and we'll answer questions as time allows. So Dr. Fetchy, we have a couple questions on this. So I'll address this one first. Uh, can immunotherapy be effective for other tumor types aside from GBM? We have a few people who've asked about its efficacy for anaplastic astrocytoma, meningioma, or for non-malignant brain tumors. Can you touch on that? So in principle, yes. Uh, there's, there's nothing about any of those tumors mentioned uh, that would preclude them from being targetable with immunotherapy. Um, you know, meningioma, uh, you know, has been a surgical disease, and so there has been less pressure for people to develop immunotherapies, but there are things like, um, you know, grade two and higher grade meningiomas that are more uh, tenacious and resistant to therapy. And in fact, people are starting to, excuse me, to look at uh, ways of designing immunotherapeutic approaches. All you really need is a target that's specific to those tumors. Um, so you need some type of protein antigen that's fairly ubiquitously expressed, and in theory, you can you can train the immune system against that. Uh, there are actually quite a number of open immunotherapy trials for low-grade gliomas. I know that was one of the questions. Uh, there are uh, trials going after um, the IDH1 mutation. Uh, there are vaccine trials for that. There are people uh, characterizing an individual patient's low-grade gliomas to look at their specific mutations and then custom designing vaccines that go after your specific tumors uh, uh, mutations. Those trials are open, uh, particularly in Germany, but also in the U.S. as well. Uh, and so the shortest answer there is absolutely. Uh, and if anything, GBM is one of the more challenging tumors to go after with immune therapies because of everything it does to the immune system uh, and because of how heterogeneous it is. Uh, but uh, if anything, immunotherapy has been very successful against some other solid cancers like breast, melanoma, and lung. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question here asking, um, are there any immunotherapy options that are available for brain tumors outside of clinical trials, or do patients who want to use this treatment have to enroll in a clinical trial for it? 
Yeah, so that's that first slide, unfortunately, where there are no FDA approved immunotherapies. So, um, uh, and what that really means is that if they're not FDA approved, they're not in commercial production. So if you want to participate in an immunotherapy trial, uh, you have to do that via clinical trial currently in the United States. Thank you. And a follow-up question to that. How does a patient or how can a patient understand which clinical trials are appropriate or applicable to them? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, places like the ABTA, I think, uh, do a fairly good job of communicating with patients. Uh, there's also something called the Brain Tumor Network, which is uh, based out of Florida that's affiliated with a group called the Sontag Foundation. And they run essentially a nonprofit uh, that you can call into and, and they will help pair you with uh, uh, various clinical trials or institutions across the United States. And if you're going to an academic center, and I, and I think you know it's important to note that these trials are almost exclusively available through academic centers. Uh, so if you go to any big academic center, they should, in theory, have a clinical trial available, or uh, if they don't have one that you're eligible for, it's a small enough field and we know enough about each other uh, that the uh, most places should be fairly accommodating in trying to find you a trial across the United States that you might be um, appropriate for. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing those great resources. We will be sending out a resource handout to all of our attendees post-event, and we'll be sure to include that in there as well. Um, kind of bouncing off of that as well, we have a question asking about uh, what are some considerations patients should keep in mind when they're trying to decide what treatment center to undergo a trial at or to um, undergo their treatments at? Yeah, I think, you know, experience is a big one. Uh, you know, uh, larger academic centers in general are going to have more experience with these tumors and certainly with, you know, clinical trials and clinical trial availability. Um, uh, you know, so these are the big university hospitals, of course. Um you know, you, you want to find someone who who specializes specifically in these types of cancers uh, because they are not super common, right? We say about 25, 26,000 GBMs diagnosed each year. That sounds like a lot, but that's really small compared to some of the other larger cancers that uh, you're familiar with. And so, you know, if an institution sees a thousand of those in a year, that's a very big GBM program, right? So, Getting a sense for what types of programs see those types of numbers is probably a, a good idea. Uh, and, and also figuring out, uh, you know, who does research at these institutions. You can, you can certainly find what type of GBM research is being done in the institution because the types of institutions that clinically do well are going to tend to have people that are studying this disease as well. Uh, and so they tend to be paired up together. Um, you know, my job is not to come here and try to sing the praise of any particular institution. You know, obviously, I'm a little biased being at Duke, uh, but there are a variety of places out there with outstanding experience. Uh, and I think if you start asking the right questions of the right people, you'll get pretty consistent word of mouth answers for sure. Uh, uh, the uh, Internet can be uh, certainly a, a resource there as well. And I'm again, the resources that the ABTA will share with you. Um, it's it's not hard to uh, to find someone who can give you a pretty honest answer about where people have good experience and good experts. Thank you so much for that great advice. Uh, we have a question here asking, can immunotherapy be effective for glioblastoma with leptomeningeal spread? You know, to date, there really hasn't been a trial uh, for that. Um, I would say that, you know, some of the therapies that uh, are that should have um, fairly regional delivery. So as an example, the CAR T cell therapy trial that I put up that's being done out of the Harvard group, uh, that's injected intrathecally, meaning into the CSF spaces, into the ventricular system, which would be in communication with any spaces where leptomeningeal spread uh, had affected, in other words, through the CSF, through the fluids. So I would say, you know, something that's being delivered into that space would have the best shot of having efficacy against leptomeningeal disease. The problem, and I and I, I hate to say this, but I'm, I speak only the truth, is that because some of these therapies are experimental and because leptomeningeal disease right now represents a fairly advanced stage, in general, trials are likely to exclude that because it'll be very difficult to understand how these therapies impact survival when you have a different group with very, very advanced disease like that. So what I would say is that the best chance of getting a, getting someone with leptomeningeal disease on a trial is to go somewhere where the trial 
might have some efficacy in attempting to get what's called compassionate use, uh, which is a, a way around that. Uh, people can be placed on trials for compassionate use uh, that, uh, uh, or drugs for compassionate use uh, that might not otherwise be accessible and may not and may be included outside of the trial. Uh, so that that would be my kind of um, two cents there on on how to potentially get access to those types of drugs. But I would again say that if you want something with li that's liable to have any type of efficacy against leptomeningeal disease, it should be a drug that's being delivered into the CSF spaces. Thank you so much for that insight. Uh, can you talk about, um, there's that clinical trial that we've been hearing about of vorasidinib with combining vorasidinib with Keytruda. Can you talk about what the purpose of that is or what the potential benefit could be of combining those two treatments? Yeah, the vorasidinib is a big deal right now because that's an IDH inhibitor. Um, so we have to back up just a second to explain that. So uh, this is really just a function of low-grade gliomas that we're going to be talking about here, or specifically grade two and grade three. Uh, but really, for the most part, I think most of the data are in grade two at this point. So uh, the majority of grade two gliomas are IDH mutated, about two-thirds of them, give or, give or take. And um, that IDH mutation is actually a marker generally of a tumor that does not grow as rapidly and therefore better survival for patients that harbor that mutation in their tumor. Uh, but the mutation uh, produces a dead end metabolite in cells uh, that, um, that actually seems to have some kind of uh, tumor growth driving effects. And so uh, one can debate the merits of, of, of inhibiting the, end, the mutation, et cetera, but in general, the idea here is that you're going after that tumor-specific mutation with a drug to limit the production of this product that might have tumor-driving effects. And so that's the drug, and it has been trialed now at fairly advanced clinical trials with fairly good results. And so you're seeing it pop up more and more, I think, at academic centers as a drug that people with IDH-mutated low-grade gliomas specifically will have access to. Um, now, we also talked about the fact that immune checkpoint blockade like nivolumab or anti-PD-1 um, have so far been not particularly successful in GBM. There have been not as many trials yet in low-grade glioma. But the idea here is that uh, part of the problem is that, you know, it may not work in isolation. And the theory is that it may work better when combined with other drugs, particularly if those drugs are able of, uh, to stimulate an immune response. Uh, or to license an immune response, even if they're not immunotherapies directly. And so the idea here is that um, you may be able to get a better immune response by combining those two drugs and now suddenly garnish a response to anti-PD-1 that wasn't there before. Um, the, the jury is out. That's an active trial. I can't tell you whether or not that's going to prove to be successful or not, uh, but that's the rationale. Thank you so much for explaining that and for also providing that background on vorasidinib as well. Um, another question we have here, I think this might be our last one that we have time for is asking, um, has, has immunotherapy ever been used uh, as a preventative measure? And for example, uh, this person is asking for children or individuals who may have genetic markers or predisposition to certain types of cancer. Yes and no. So, um... There are examples of that. Uh, so there are a string of cancers out there that have viral causes. Probably the best known of those that's most prevalent is cervical cancer, uh, not of the neck, of the cervix, so uh, women. Uh, and the cause of that is HPV, uh, which is human papillomavirus. And there are certain strains that are responsible. And it is now highly advised uh, that young women that are sexually active or even approaching that age and and men now as well, uh, receive the HPV vaccine because it produces, uh, it prevents what is actually a sexually transmitted disease that is responsible for a cancer. Uh, and so uh, in, in cancers that are caused by viruses, that type of preventative vaccine is already out there. So uh, I think it's Gardasil is the name brand, I, I can't remember, but it's the anti-HPV vaccine. That's probably the best example. But as far as vaccinating people uh, against a cancer that doesn't have an infectious etiology like that uh, because they're high risk, not, not to date, uh, uh, to my knowledge. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fetchy, for all of your answers and uh, for sharing this wonderful presentation. Just looking through some of the comments that have come through from our attendees. Uh, I know you started off with kind of that the doom and gloom aspect of immunotherapy, but a lot of our attendees are sharing how much hope what everything that you have shared has given. So thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise and your insight on this topic. My pleasure. And I also want to give a thank you to today's webinar sponsor, IMVAX, for their support of this program and a huge special thank you to each and one, every one of you who have joined us online today and shared your wonderful questions. We hope that you have found this webinar to be informative and beneficial. We encourage you to take a few minutes to complete our webinar survey by scanning the QR code on your smartphone or going to the link on the screen there. Your feedback is important to us as we plan for future programs. You will also receive a link to complete the survey along with the webinar recording and our resource handout in a follow-up email message in the next few days. For more information about ABTA's programs, events, and services, visit ABTA's website at abta.org, email us at info at abta.org, or call the ABTA Care Line at 1-800-886-2282. This now concludes our webinar. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.